On this prequel episode, we've got our Annihilation fan poll follow-up. We're learning about putting a story into historical context and previewing Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. Hello and welcome back to This Film is Lit, the podcast where we talk about movies that are based on books. We have a lot of follow-up people. You all came through on the feedback on Annihilation, so we have a lot to discuss. Very excited. Looking forward to it. Uh, but first, we're going to do what we always do and give a shout-out to our new and Academy Award-winning patrons. I put up with you because your father and mother were our finest patrons, that's why. We have one new patron this week at the $5 Hugo Award winning level getting access to our bonus content, and that is Opens Up for Nobody. Thank you, Opens Up for Nobody, for supporting us for 5 bucks a month. Make sure you check out all of our bonus content that we've put out, including uh, in a couple weeks we'll be putting out our bonus content for July. We're discussing Midsommar, so look out for that before too long. And as always, we wanted to thank our Academy Award winning patrons, and they are Steve from Arizona, Paul Kadensminger, Ben Wilcox, Jeff Niederhofer, Teresa Schwartz, Ian from Wine Country, All Literature is Fan Fiction, Change My Mind, Winchester's Forever, Kelly Napier, Gray Hightower, Eli Youngs, Gratch, Just Gratch, Shelby Says Pre Order, It Calls from the Veil, That Darn Skag, V Frank, Well, That Was Certainly Weird. And Alina Starkov. Thank you all very much for supporting us and continuing to support us. We appreciate it. Katie, let's see what the people had to say about Annihilation. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. Quite a bit. Quite a bit. Which is what we love. That's what we want. <laughs> we appreciate it. On Patreon, we had four votes for the book, two for the movie, and one listener who couldn't decide. Much like yourself. Mm -hmm. Opens up for nobody. Our, our, our newest new patron. patron said, Annihilation is my favorite movie, mostly because of the back half, especially the moments in the lighthouse. I have a complicated relationship with the book, probably in part because I could nebulously be categorized as a biologist. Nebulously categorized biologist is a lot of syllables going on in a very short span. There. Nebulously categorized <laughs> as a biologist, though, I think you should put on your resume. Yes. I like it. It's good. Um, as someone wandering the fields of ecology, microbiology, and astrobiology. Astrobiology. Now that is something. I mean, it's all something, but... <laughs> And sometimes the book is written a bit like someone who knows the shape of what a scientist is, but not what it's like to be one. Mostly it's okay, but a few lines just feel too science TM. Another big part is probably that I relate a lot to the biologist in a way that's hard to articulate, and I can't stand to see myself reflected in media. She feels very autistic, is what I mean. She's human, but she feels apart from everyone else. She's operating on a different frequency. So when she goes into the Area X, it's just an externalization of what she already was. Different, inhuman. Obviously, I'm not saying that autistic people are inhuman, just ca commenting on how it sometimes feels like to interface with people when you are autistic. She thought she was going in for the sake of her husband, but it was never really about him. She loved him, but didn't need him. In some ways, she recognizes that it's sad she and her husband missed out on the connection they could have had, but she does not mourn her loss of humanity because she never felt human to begin with and seeks to further her alienation. So I like the book as supplemental to the movie. After rereading this book, I always say I dislike it, although I've read it four times now. I've decided it's not so much I dislike it overall, though there are aspects that I do truly like, Dislike. It's, that I do truly dislike. It's more that I find it personally difficult to read. I've read the other books too. I don't remember them very well, only that I liked them less and less. I don't want Area X explained. I just want it to, I just want to watch it devour things. Anyway, I'm a longtime listener, first time commenter. I've listened to y'all through much mindless data collection, and I'm very glad you did Annihilation. It encouraged me to confront this book that was ob that obviously touches a nerve in me. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, came back a little bit later and left another comment that said, I changed my mind. I do actively dislike the book. It's just that I find some of the ideas compelling and I like things that make me mad. 
Very thoughtful comment there. Thank you for spending that time writing that feedback uh, and lending your perspective. I, I I I agree with a lot of it. I obviously didn't. I don't. So I don't have the. Um, I did get the vibe reading the book. I didn't go into this in the episode because I didn't do a lot of reading, external reading about other interpretations and stuff about it. To me, when I read the character of the biologist in the book, I also got the vibe that this character is probably autistic or meant mm-hmm. to be autistic in some way. Um, for sure. Like a, a lot of, again, from my understanding of it, um, but it's not something I went into in great depth. Again, I don't have that frame of reference. And it's also I just didn't do a lot of external reading to kind of validate that reading of it or or, or discuss that reading of it. But it totally tracks to me that that you would feel that way. I will say that I do think the. Um, the the part about this, I am not a scientist, but I, I was on a track to be at one point. Um, but I, I do know what they're saying in regards to the like someone who knows the shape of what a scientist is, but not what it's like to be one. I do think that's probably an apt criticism of the book from what from what I can glean from my limited science uh, knowledge and experience. Uh, but I don't think it to me, it didn't harm the book in any way. That being said, I am not <laughs> a scientist, so it's not as as much of a thing that I would notice as sort of meticulously as somebody who is a biologist or whatever. Um for me, it worked uh, sort of, again, her being the shape of a, a scientist and not actually one uh, worked for me. But uh, I think it is really interesting that you have read the book so many times and <laughs> dislike it. I I mean, you, you, you did kind of, I think, lay out the main point is that you, you dislike seeing yourself reflected in media, which is interesting. I feel like that's not a, cr- a critique that I hear or like a thing that I hear people say about, you know, like I was. Yeah. I mean, I there there is like the the sort of generic uh, complaint of like, you know, or not complaint, but um, I'm in this picture and I don't like it like kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And like, I think that's kind of what they're getting at here is like um, they're seeing parts of them that they maybe aren't the fondest of or whatever reflected. Yeah. But, in yeah. the character of the biologist. But. I think it is an interesting portrayal of somebody who probably does fall on the autism spectrum and the way they handle relationships. And again, that is kind of what I was trying to touch on in the the nature of the fallout of their relationship in the book is mm-hmm. so sort of nuanced and different than it is in the film. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with just the way that the biologist character interacts with people and the world. Yeah. And that's kind of what they were getting across here. All right. Um, Steve from Arizona said, I'm going with the book and this is in no way an indictment on Alex Garland because I generally love his writing and directing. Deep down, I feel this movie could have been closer adapted to the book. Garland has a very specific directing style that I do not feel is conducive to the way the story is written. I figure a different type of director like uh, Panos Cosmatos, 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 I believe. Um, or Robert Eggers would have brought out the underlying cosmic horror of Area X in a way that would not rely on mutated flora and fauna. Area X is unsettling in its familiarity, not its alien dreamscape, at least in my opinion. Now, did I like the movie? Yes, I did. Did I hate demonizing Lena as an adulteress? That was really the only thing that turned me off. I really felt it should have been done a different way. Anyway, the book also compelled me to read the other two books, and that is a good thing in my view. Also, in response to Brian's military metaphor to the movie, I kind of felt it was closer to Stanley Milgram's authority studies, which is what really piqued my interest when the psychologist started using hypnotic suggestion in the book. Either way, there is so much to really surmise from the story, which is why I lean towards the written word, even though the movie was definitely in my wheelhouse great episode thank you for that feedback um i agree that uh uh, particularly i don't think i've actually seen a panos cosmatos film i know the one that he got a lot of um a fair amount of acclaim for uh was a Nicolas cage film from a couple years ago uh that i cannot remember that mandy Hmm. um but he also did uh beyond the black rainbow rewind this but mandy is the one that like lots of people have talked about that came out in 2018 um that he wrote and directed. But anyways, I, uh, so I don't know. I I haven't seen Mandy, so I don't know. Robert Eggers, I think would be very good for this kind of thing. That being said, I do think Alex Garland kind of nailed it. And I don't even disagree with your criticism or your, your, your um, point that uh, the underlying cosmic horror of area X is in a way 
or wait, uh, is unsettling in its familiarity, not its alien dreamscape, in your opinion. I don't even necessarily disagree, but to me, reading the book, it was both. Like, it's it's the, the fact that it is familiar, but also just weirdly weird enough mm-hmm. and alien enough that it's not, which is a thing that I think Alex Garland does really well. Like, that's kind of the whole point of Ex Machina, is that, like, the uncanny valley between humanity and... Yeah. Something that basically is humanity, but, but we're like, trying to figure out if it is. Yeah. <laughs> and like what what you know, how we deal with that that disparity in what we're seeing and versus what we, you know. And so like I think I think Alex Garland works really well for this, and I think he kind of crushed it uh, in that regard. I but I, I get I I do see your point. Um I just think it would have made for a more visually uninteresting film than what we got. That being said, Robert Eggert's probably could have done a really interesting version of this film. I don't disagree with that at all. What was the other one? Oh, the other point I wanted, the main one I wanted to talk about is the, um, I hated the, hated the demonizing of Lena as an adulteress. And that was the only thing that turned you off. I, I mean, I agree in the sense that movies throughout history have tended to, uh, sort of, um, it's an easy trope to like demonize a woman because she cheats on a dude, but also she did cheat on him. Like that's a thing that women can do and can be bad. And you can have your characters do that and can be a bad thing. They do. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I understand that, like, there's there's some baggage there, but it's also just a thing that can be a bad thing. And I think the thing that it really is where the movie, it doesn't necessarily even demonize her, in my opinion, for the affair. It demonizes her for never addressing it, which to me is is a more interesting point. Like, it's not. It's, the movie mm-hmm. has less to say about her having the affair than it does about her never, never confronting, like confronting it, it or trying, or to, make trying it right. to make it right or yeah. do anything about it. Which I, I think is a slightly different thing from just demonizing yeah. someone for having an affair. Yeah, the movie's not like, to me at least, didn't feel like, you know, like calling her a harlot and, and you know, like mm-hmm. that kind of thing. To me, it felt like you're 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 you're, you're, there's some under other issues that you're not confronting the affair is just that uh, a very like striking manifestation of these other issues you have and you're not handling that um again there's some baggage there because it is something that tends to be like a an easy cheap way to to make people dislike a a a woman character in things yeah (laughs) so like i get that um i just don't think that this movie uh, somewhat in a vacuum I don't think it falls prey to that at least it didn't in my opinion because I also thought about that while we were watching it I'm just like okay yeah like that's kind of a expected you know oh right. she cheated on her husband and he's just this great guy who didn't deserve you know like there, there's a lot of baggage there but again I think the movie takes it enough in a, in a if interesting different direction that it doesn't feel like just a cheap sort of trope that that is problematic and not un um and it's not unacknowledged within mm-hmm. the film, I don't think. That darn skag said, I went with the book, although this might largely be because I've seen the movie multiple times and I finally read the book for the first time, all in one sitting in a dark room. There's just something about the pictures my mind painted and the theories I couldn't help but form and how the prose made my spine tingle as if someone was watching me read. The movie is amazing, and upon rewatch, I believe even more firmly that Garland should direct a Solaris remake. The visualizations of Area X and the crawler, and the combination of off-putting and paranoid behavior of the characters are very well done. I would agree with all that. Uh, I can't, I truly can't remember if we did mention Alex Garland when we were talking about him. I think we did. I think, because I know at one point during our Solaris episode, we discussed at the end, if we made a remake, who should make it? And I think we did. Or it might have been in the I prequel feel episode. Like follow up. Pretty positive. We would have said. I feel Alex like Garland. we said Alex Garland, <laughs> but we we there was may have been somebody else, but I think we did. Um, but anyways, I agree with that 100 percent. He would make a fantastic uh, Solaris. Um, also, going to the comment from above, I think Robert Eggers would do a good Solaris. But um, I, I agree. One of the things and it is one of the, the things that gives the points, the book, some points in my mind is I did have a similar experience of the, you know, the pictures that your mind paints reading the book uh, and how the prose made your spine tingle and made it feel as if somebody was watching you read. I had a very similar experience reading mm-hmm. the book, which is not a common thing Yeah, when reading a book, at least for me. 
Yeah. And so in that regard, that is definitely a huge point to the book. Right. Well, and I, I think like having that kind of experience reading is something that gets harder and harder the older you get. Right. So, yeah. The yeah, more it, you've it, read. Yeah, yeah. It is kind of um, a singular experience. It is. As and an so adult. that's definitely I can see for that reason, giving it to the book. I will say the movie gave me a similar experience for the last 20 or 30 minutes. I mentioned in the episode that I literally had like full body chills for the entire like mirror Lena scene um, for basically from the moment the. um uh what's her name the the psychologist burst into energy until basically the end of the movie i was like completely riveted and like hair standing up uh, on on the back of my neck that whole time so it was a very similar feeling experience but it was so concentrated and intense in the film for the last 20 minutes whereas the movie it was kind of more like or the book it was kind of more like ebbs and flows throughout mm. it's you know six of one half dozen of the other the fact that the movie was able to capture a similar type of experience and feeling was one of the reasons that I had a hard time giving it to one or the other. So I will say that in my experience, that kind of experience is rarer in a book form, reading a book than it is watching a movie. So maybe you could argue the book because of that is, is, is deserves the, the win. I would just say that I, I think that depends a lot on the person yeah, and whether or not you're more like, moved by reading stuff than why it, it i think that depends a lot on the viewer and the consumer of the media but anyways lost remote control said the book wins for me that lost feeling when you have finished and have questions can be so fulfilling if done well and i think the book did it better also i think the imagination works better for this unknown entity trope better than a visual medium the movie just has a handicap here handicap here but they did as well as they could would agree with that too it is it, you are handicapped in the film by trying to yeah put put to screen these chaotic um undescribable like literally described as undescribable things mm -hmm. in the in the book um to try to put that on film is difficult uh, and so that you're always going to lose something compared to what your your imagination is doing um but i was just so impressed with how the movie did it that yeah which is what you said yeah they did a good job over on Facebook, we had two votes for the book and one for the movie. Adam said, I said back when you announced you were doing Annihilation that I didn't think I'd be able to choose, and I still can't. I agree with Brian. The movie doesn't just try to be a cover version of the novel. It takes the motifs and phrases of it and writes its own song that's just as good as the original, but in entirely different ways. I was thinking the real reason the linguist was cut from the mission was because all her time working with and processing language in different ways made the control programming not take. Mm. I read all three books in rapid succession way back around when the movie was coming out, so unfortunately I can't remember if there's any textual evidence to back that up from the later book where we get the psychologist's point of view, or if it's just an ad hoc head headcanon explanation I came up with to add justification to me spending all that time on a linguistics degree. I do recommend you go on and read the rest of the trilogy, though. It doesn't get any less weird. Interesting. Um, I, that's an interesting idea from the book. Uh, I, I think that would make sense. Um, mm -hmm. Again, he, I think it, it's in this book, it's not stated. The reason is just sort of mysteriously left unknown to our main character of why the linguist didn't make it through the the testing phases or the prep phases or whatever. Um, but I think that is a very solid headcanon explanation, even if it is not textually supported, which it may be. But uh, that's, yeah, it's fun. Andy said, in this case, I've only seen the film, but I have voted for the book. It's because I loved the film, but came away feeling like something was just not there with the characters and theme, like a layer was missing. Then, when Brian was talking on the pod about the book, the hypnotic commands, and the parallels with conditioning, I thought, that's it. If this doesn't seem legit, then subtract one vote for the book. We'll read it now for sure. Well, there you go. No, that's fine. You can yeah, vote I for the book, especially if you're going to go forward and read it. <laughs> I think that's totally fine. I never, I, I definitely didn't get the feeling coming away from the movie like something was missing or not there with the characters and the theme. In fact, I it, the, thematically, I think that the characters might be a little deeper in the book, mainly because mm -hmm. you just get more, you get more right. of them. Um, specifically our uh, our main character, the biologist. Um, and so I think you could argue that in the book, the character is a little deeper. 
Uh, thematically, though, I think, as I said in the episode, that the movie just sort of constrains the theme in a way that feels more <laughs> easily digestible. Or, uh, while still being fairly vague and nuanced and interesting, it, it, it feels like it has a more concrete thematic through line that I feel like the book kind of lacks. Mm -hmm. I think the first commenter got pretty close discussing sort of the alienation of our main character and that being why part tying into why they stay in area X at the end of the book, um, because they've always kind of felt alienated because they are, they do experience and view the world so differently than everybody else. And that's, we get a lot of that in the backstory in the book about like her, her being a biologist, as a little kid and in the pond and the pool that turns into a pond and all this sort of stuff. But so I, I still would argue that I think thematically the film is just a little stronger Whereas maybe the the characters are a little stronger in the book potentially, and so I I could go I could see kind of evens out I guess in that regard for me. But I'm glad you're going to go and read it. It's worth it. It's a lot of fun. Our last comment on Facebook was from Ian, who said, "You must not read from the book." <laughs> yeah, I saw that he posted the gist. Did, yeah, is what I was internally screaming as Brian read aloud the creepy ass passage <laughs> that's written on the wall. To get to the catacombs beneath Paris, one has to take a spiral staircase 300 steps down beneath the city. If that necromantic manifesto had been on the walls on the way down, that would have been a hard pass for me. And I don't scare easily. Yeah. With Never Ending Story and Harry Potter, there was always the plan that one day I'll read them. And with the podcast, that has become a definite. I honestly didn't expect myself halfway through this episode to put the Southern Reach books on my to-read list. Well, I'm glad that I could convince so many of our listeners to go check out the <laughs> books, cause, or at least the first. Again, I haven't read any of the other ones, um, but if they are of similar length of to the first one, I actually do want to read them. Um, if they start getting way longer, <laughs> maybe not, but uh, this one being 200 pages is kind of perfect. It didn't take very long to get through. But no, that's great. Uh, and yeah, that, that, that passage is horrifying and... Yeah, no thank you. On Twitter, we had three votes for the book, two for the movie, and two listeners who couldn't decide. Kelly Napier said, I wasn't going to read this one, but after listening to the episode, I picked it up at the library. But this leads to a question for me that you just answered. Mm -hmm. When an episode covers one book in a series, oh, do you go. ever want to go and finish it up? I ended up checking out all three books because I'm a completionist. Yeah, I mean, it definitely depends on... And you would this would be applied more to you than me because yeah. you do more of the reading. But for me, at least, it definitely depends on um, how uh, how much I enjoyed the book, obviously, yeah. but also um, what I know of uh, how <laughs> how the series goes on. Like, uh, so I, one thing I will say is I'm not particularly interested, and I don't remember if I said this at the time or not, in continuing Dune. I may read Dune Messiah, the second yeah. one, because I believe that there's going to be at least movie wise stuff from that uh, it's down the road potentially. And it's also, I think considered one of the better ones, but like, I, I'm just not going to read all of the Dune series. It's too long. There's too many books and I've heard it gets too weird and too like, yeah, kind of uh, esoteric and just, I, I'm not particularly interested in it. Um, but something like this, uh, where uh, it, there, from, from what I've read of some of the details from the later books, it, it sounds interesting. And again, if it's pretty short and I can read it pretty quickly, that's another Another reason that I would want to be into that. I am not a completionist. <laughs> I really don't care. Um, and if I am not. If I'm not fully 100 percent into what the first book in a series is selling me, and I mean, like, really like balls to the walls into it. I don't care. Fair enough. <laughs> and 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 to be like perfectly candid i i read a lot for the show oh yeah you and i so i much. don't have the attention span that i used to yeah um so i i i pass on a lot of things these days yeah yeah i mean you're constantly reading for the show in a way that i'm not so uh, shelby says pre-order it calls from the veil said just about everything i enjoyed in the book didn't really make it into the movie Everything with the tower, the lighthouse, the run on fire and brimstone words. Uh, everything with the tower, the lighthouse, the run on fire and brimstone words and the uneasy dramatic. Gosh. And the uneasy dynamic between our main characters in this unreal situation. 
On top of that, I appreciated the book's version of the biologist's relationship with her husband and how it was explored. I found it more interesting overall. I get why the movie changed it to cheating, but I'm tired of that trope and I don't like it, so I'm going to complain about it. To me, the arc of the book is about the biologist coming to terms with her relationship with her husband and reconciling her role in the dissolution of their marriage. Everything with Area X is the backdrop to help her explore this. There's a weird idea in the book that her husband thought that bonding over Area X could have saved their marriage, and as strange as it sounds, I kind of bought it with everything we knew about them and all the things going on. I didn't have the same experience with the movie. It's got some great imagery and some good scenes, and the bear was a standout. I did like the sound design of the creature at the end and the direction they took with Anya's character, but beyond that, I didn't get the same overall vibe from the movie that I did with the book. At some point, I realized the flashbacks in the movie to Before Kane Came Back were only for us, not the other characters in the frame story, and it left me feeling a bit too much like she was an unreliable narrator and the final moment could have meant anything at all. But maybe that's just me. Also, Lena just defeats Area X in the movie, and then they do the very Hollywood or is it dead moment with the shimmer in their eyes. I just wasn't a fan. Okay. Couple things. I agree with a lot of this over, or I say agree. I obviously have some slightly different opinions, but I, I totally get what you're where you're coming from. I will say, I'm a little unsure of what. At some point, I realized the flashbacks in the movie to before Kane came back were only for us, not the other characters in the frame story. Right. So the some of the flashbacks, like I, I assume that this refers to like flashbacks with her and Kane like together in their bedroom, and then yeah. like the flashbacks of her cheating. Yeah, they're for the audience, right? And not they're not part of the frame story where she's being like debriefed. Definitely not that. Okay, sure, but I believe that what they are is her dreaming. She always wakes up in the film. Oh, it's she? almost always tied to her like being asleep and having so I believe she is her character specifically. Uh -huh. And I could be wrong about this, having only watched it once, but I know there's at least several times where those flashbacks happen right before we cut into Area X and she's waking up from okay. from sleeping. And so I think we are to understand that those flashbacks aren't just for us. They are, in fact, also um, Lena is having those memories mm -hmm. as we're watching them. But she is the only one. Nobody else is. W w she's not sharing the, that story with right. definitely not anybody like with, with Benedict Wong or whatever from the <laughs> from the frame story. Um, so to me, I didn't get like we were getting a, an unreliable narrator vibe, but instead we were seeing her memories of their relationship mm -hmm. and the, the and because of the guilt she had from it she was having these sort of almost nightmares even though they weren't necessarily nightmare like they were they were memories um that were kind of racking her mind as she was sleeping and stuff again i could be wrong but i my thought was that literally every time we come back from one of those she is waking up from having been asleep um but anyways um so so I, I don't know if I necessarily am on board with that. I don't think that we were, we're I don't think we're to get an unreliable narrator vibe from this, in my opinion, uh, in the in the movie, the book, maybe a little bit because it's it's a little different. I agree. Defeating Area X is kind of weird and doesn't make a lot of sense. But if you're not making another one, I, I think with what they were doing. Yeah, do you think they knew at that point they weren't going to make any more? I think so. I don't yeah. think they were planning. I think he had only ever planned this as a single movie, even though he knew there were other. I think he just wanted to make the one movie or whatever. Um, and then the very Hollywood or is it dead moment with the shimmer in their eyes. Again, I truly that's not in my interpretation is that is not <laughs> the point of that scene at all. You can read it that way. And like you can kind of groan if you want at like, oh, they're doing the is it actually dead thing. To me, it's not about that at all, so it doesn't matter. Uh -huh. <laughs> like, like narratively, that is unimportant, <laughs> whether or not it is dead or like whatever. Or oh, is she carrying back the the shimmer in them, or what? What's gonna like? None of that matters. It's it's all just symbolic of the fact that she has not dealt with mm -hmm. um, her guilt, her trauma, or and 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 they have not <laughs> reconciled or dealt with the the elephant in the room which is um the falling out of their relationship 
And the shimmer is just sort of emblematic of that. It is not to be taken literally like, again, you can like yeah. it. I think for audiences who aren't thinking about it too much, um, like like wide audiences in the theater, it is kind of I think they. I, I will say this. I'll, I'll at least agree in this regard that I think that maybe they were like trying to have their cake and eat it too there. Whereas for people who aren't like who aren't thinking about it thematically, who are just watching it. Uh, and going like, oh, oh, they get like the, you know, like it is kind of a cliche Hollywood like horror movie ending. Like, oh, is the the demon actually gone or whatever? Or the the it goes to the alien or whatever. And I and I think Shelby under, like agrees with this. Is that that is not I don't think what the filmmakers are going for. But I agree that they are kind of again having their cake and eating it too there mm-hmm. by getting to kind of do that, um, while still making it. Well, that not being the point, it being a thematic <laughs> thing. I don't know. But yeah, I I love that ending. Initially, I didn't. I, I will say this, and this may help a little bit. Initially, when as soon as it happened, like for the five or ten minutes after, I was like, well, that was stupid. Mm-hmm. And then I thought about it a little bit more, and I completely changed my mind and decided that I really liked it. Once I thought about more of the implications for her character and what that means about her, because once I realized, well, clearly she's not a copy or whatever, like she's not the mimic or whatever, it's her. What does this mean? Like that is when it to me it, it clicked in and then worked. But anyways, your mileage may right. vary, obviously. <laughs> uh, on Instagram, we had two votes for the book and four for the movie. This was the only platform where the movie came out on top. Uh, Patrick Braun, 1988, said, I love them both, but the book and the trilogy are my absolute favorite. Fair enough. Tim Wahoo said, if true... I appreciate the director's approach to adapt the story from their memory. Seems totally plausible to me having watched the movie or having read the book and watched the movie. Seems (laughs) totally plausible. And Luca Noel Bell said, having read the book and watched the movie, my vote is for the movie. It's on my list of all time greats and continues to haunt me years after my first watch. The book just never achieved the same heights. The inclusion of hypnosis made the book feel written i'll suspend disbelief for alien life but there is no way hypnosis works like that the movie on the other hand had a uh vermicillitude i think is how verisimilitude. Verisimilitude, verisimilitude verisimilitude yeah. that imbued the story even as it grew increasingly alien i'm surprised you didn't talk about how the movie annihilation is a metaphor for cancer that too the shimmer is a cancer on the earth it starts as a small anomaly but continues to grow larger and larger until it threatens all life it's mutation leading to unchecked growth the alien like cancer is not itself malicious it only knows to grow corrupt and mimic to me this is much more terrifying than your normal horror movie villain. So the cancer thing is definitely there. Um obviously ties in with um what happens to her husband but also what uh, what we know about the psychologist in the film which is not an element of the book that she has cancer and that sort of thing. And I think it also is just we're playing with clearly um uh, symbolic uh elements of or metaphorical elements of literal cancer but also trauma and the way that mm-hmm. trauma infects and spreads and um that sort of thing and and so i think it's you you definitely there is the the very the very obvious not i don't say very obvious the very um defensible reading of uh the shimmer and stuff as sort of indicative of cancer and that sort of thing but i i i think it's even more nebulous than that i think Mm -hmm. i think that's one very valid and, and good reading of it but i think it's even i think you can even take a step back and it's it's more nebulous and more a wider than that again to like trauma to guilt to like all of anything like negative that can spread and when unchecked when unchecked can spread yeah um and cancer is just one of those things but it, I, I again i agree that that is definitely a very valid reading of the the, the shimmer and whatnot um the other thing i was gonna say uh, where did it go oh i i do disagree uh, that the inclusion of hypnosis really made the book feel written. I'll suspend, suspend disbelief for alien life, but there's no way hypnosis works like that. If that's a problem you have with suspending disbelief, I mean, I can't tell you not that not to <laughs> not do that. I will say that I, I, with something like that, I just bought, I mean, we have this weird alien, like, I don't know, within the universe of the story, I buy 
that maybe there's this advanced n- new crazy form of hypnosis. Yes, that's not how hypnosis works in reality. I agree 100%. Um, but within this universe uh, where we have some crazy stuff going on, it also is, I think, supposed to take place at least vaguely in the future. Not like way in the future, but at least a little bit. I can buy that there is some some strange government form of hypno again because there are some shady organization they came up with some technique that allows them to 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 perform hypnosis that is uh, again not the way it works in real life uh so that wasn't an issue for me i can't tell you for that not to be an issue for you i just you know i would i would say that it it didn't bother me (laughs) at all (laughs) But, you know, everybody's got their own. Everybody has their own lines. And it is hard because there are things like that that can bother me and stuff. It just Mm kind of depends on the overall um, quality of the story, you know, the movie or film or whatever or book or whatever, where whether or not things like that will annoy me. It really just just depends. Um, And in this case, it did not because I I thought it just worked so seamlessly uh, with what was going on. And I thought it worked thematically to where I was able to, I I didn't care. I was like, sure, let's do it. That yeah. Hypnosis. You have a different, better form of hypnosis. That is not a real thing. Fine. Like, sure. All right. Uh, So our winner was the book with 11 votes to the movies, nine. Uh, So a pretty narrow margin. And there were also three listeners who could not decide between the two. Uh, I'm, I'm not surprised that the book won. Maybe a little. I, I'm actually the thing that I think is is it makes the most sense is that it's as even as it is. Yeah. Considering I couldn't pick, I will say that if I was going to, I, I almost a couple times picked the movie, and then decided ultimately on a, kind of giving it a tie. Um, but I was leaning slightly towards the film mm-hmm. overall. But it, I, 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 I was going back and forth so much that it, I like, like I said, that's why I went with the tie. Um, so these these numbers don't surprise me a ton, but I would have thought there might have been a few more movie votes. If I would have had to guess, I would have thought maybe the numbers would be reversed. It'd be like 11 to not like slightly more for the movie than the book. And then a few can't decide. But I get it. Makes sense to me. All right. It's time now to learn some stuff. And what we're learning about today is putting a story into historical context. No matter what anybody tells you. Words and ideas can change the world. Okay, um, so this is, I, I feel like, maybe going to be more of a hybrid learning chatting segment uh, mm-hmm. because I didn't really have the bandwidth this week to do a ton of research and writing, uh, but I wanted to briefly discuss the historical context for this novel um, as well as like putting art into historical context in general, whether doing that is always important. Mm-hmm. Sounds um, good. I don't know anything about the historical context of this film so or slash book. So, so uh, right off the gate, here's my lukewarm take <laughs> uh, is that the context in which a piece of art was created is always at least a little bit important, but I think the level of weight that you give to that context can vary. I mean, I agree. That's a very lukewarm take. It's a very uh, lukewarm I, it, take. It's one I agree with. Uh, uh, it's funny uh, is because I think you can boil that down basically is to to that uh, the context in which we take a piece of art, uh, uh, the context in which a piece of art was created is always at least a little bit important contextually <laughs> like yeah. you have to take into context how important that context yes. is so like uh, yes you it, really do you kind of do fall into a uh, an infinite regress of like context upon context yeah. upon context all right so real quick um again not going into details with this so if you want to know more about it you're gonna have to look it up for yourself um but the historical context for tinker Tailor soldier spy the novel yeah. I'm assuming I, the movie too. I, think I don't, the movie I don't is very know how similar, much they changed. Yeah, I don't. I don't. Um, but when the novel came out in 1974, um, revelations exposing the presence of Soviet double agents in Britain were still very fresh in public memory. That was a thing that had happened recently. Um, those agents are now known as the Cambridge Five. They were a ring of spies in the UK that passed information to the Soviet Union during World War II and beyond. Um, They were active from the 1930s until at least into the early 1950s, although there were ripple effects from that, obviously stretching decades out, at least into the 90s. 
Uh, but the general public first became aware of this uh, incidents after uh, the sudden flight of agents Donald McLean uh, and Guy Burgess to the Soviet Union in 1951. So this was like a thing that was fresh in the mind of right. the public when this book came out. Um, and the author of the novel actually worked as an intelligence officer for uh, MI5 and MI6, um, SIS, I don't know anything about British foreign I don't intelligence. So. All I know, MI6 is what James Bond is. So. <laughs> yeah. um, but he worked for them in the 1950s and the early 1960s. Um, and one of uh, the Cambridge Five's uh, senior SIS officer, Kim Philby, his defection to the USSR in 1963 um, and the subsequent like compromising of even more agents was a factor in um, the 1964 termination of the author's intelligence career. Okay. So, um, the, so the novel then is also set against a theme of a uh, decline in British influence on the world stage after the Second World War, uh, with the USSR and the USA emerging as like dominant superpowers in that era. Right. So, what does that context tell us? <laughs> um, one, it tells us that the novel is a fictionalized account of something that the author experienced firsthand. So that's something that we can keep in mind as we're reading and watching. Um, but it also tells us that we can ex what we can expect from the novel is not a depiction of hard facts about the event, right? We're not reading like a nonfiction right. account. Yeah. But what we can it's expect not a journalist. Yeah, it's not a journalist about... writing this. But yeah. what we can expect is a depiction of the mood during that time period. Right. Putting a story into historical context and i'm also going to refer to this throughout as initial context right the context at the time it yes, was the context at the time created. that the story was created um because i think historical context can apply something older than maybe what we always need to talk about yeah well in historical context i think can be can mean more things yes like initial context means like the context at the time of the of of the creation whereas historical context could be at the time of creation but also like other, Dif other different ways it's been interpreted on. since then and yes. like other like i think the historical context is just a little bit wider or at least the way i would interpret it um so putting a story into a historical context or initial context i think can get not tricky but i i think like there are a lot of people plenty of people who will misuse the idea of historical context in order to brush off problematic aspects of the time period mm. and or the author. Right. Right. Uh, but I think the response to that is not to disregard initial context, but to use it responsibly, mm -hmm. ideally. Um, yeah. Because I think used responsibly, that context can help deepen your understanding of a story. So, for example, we recently discussed the Jungle Book, and we talked about the racist and imperialist context in which the Jungle Book was written. Right. Um, coming directly from the author, but also, like, the wider context right. of what the world looked like at the time, mm -hmm. which is something that none of us reading it now remember. Yeah. Um, and I, I will stand by my assertion that if you weren't aware of that context, there are many examples of racism and imperialism in the text that will simply go over your head. Right. I mean, there are, there are also plenty that won't. <laughs> yes. That are a little more on the nose. Yeah. But there are definitely, there's a lot of stuff in there that just, if you're not aware of that context, you're not going to pick up on it. So knowing that context and understanding it to the best of my ability allowed me to read the Jungle Book through a more informed lens than I would have otherwise. You know, and that doesn't mean that I get to say, well, it was just the time period, so this doesn't matter. That means that I get to educate myself better. Yeah. Um, so I mentioned at the beginning that I think how much weight you give to context can vary. Um, so let me give another example. Our summer series this year is Fifty Shades of Grey. If you're reading that book because you just like mediocre erotica, then its initial context as Twilight fan fiction isn't going to matter so much to you. Right. If you're looking at it from a more critical framework as we are, then that context 
very much does matter. Yeah. Right. Now, I would argue that there are definitely a lot of other contextual things pertaining to Fifty Shades of Grey yeah. that you should be aware of, regardless of why you're reading it. Um, but does its initial context matter in all, like, at all times? Yeah. Yeah, it kind of depends. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other important thing, I think, to remember with putting a piece of art into a uh, historical context or initial context uh, is that pop culture is an Ouroboros that circles around and eats its own tail. Mm -hmm. um, for example, since we brought up Twilight, uh, Twilight very clearly influenced by aspects of pop culture from the early 2000s, the time period in which it was written, uh, but it also had heavy influence on pop culture then throughout the late 2000s and 2010s, which in turn influenced the creation of following books and movies. You know, yeah. So that's another like contextual thing to keep in mind, especially you know, talking about adaptations as we do. The historical context for the novel is that this, um, you know, espionage event was very fresh in public memory right. at the time, um, but the movie wasn't made until decades later. So how does this that one, even yeah. then factor in, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's definitely an interesting... And one of the things I wanted to touch back on, because I thought it was interesting, is... Um, because I think it can kind of go both ways is you talked about early on uh, the historical context, how some people can misuse historical context to kind of hand wave away yeah. bigotry, racism and stuff. And be like, ah, it's just, you know, that's what it's a sign of the time. Like, that's just how, you know, everybody was back then, blah, blah, blah. And kind of hand wave away racism and stuff or whatever in the, in uh, uh, pieces of media. Um, but I think you can also, it almost can go both directions, whereas if you don't have the historical context, and this kind of ties into what you're talking about with, like, Jungle Book, there are things where if you're reading it without any historical context or initial context of what was going on at the time, you can miss yeah, absolutely. some of the bigotry and racism and yeah. other horrible things. Like, if you're reading something within a, va trying to read it within a vacuum and you don't understand the context of uh, and I'm, I can't think of a really good example off the top of my head, but I can imagine a story written, um, let's say, like that was written in apartheid South Africa mm -hmm. or something like that. If you don't know the context of apartheid South Africa and what was going on and what and like and at least a little bit there, if you're right, reading something that maybe is like uh, like an announce, like a metaphor for or something like that. You know what I mean? You well, could, I think potentially, I think potentially in a good example of that. I mean, in my specific reference, uh, uh, um, District Nine is is that. Oh, I've but never seen It's a that. film that is basically just about apartheid in South yeah. Africa, but it's about aliens instead. But there are also quite a few other criticisms and discussions to be had around District Nine. I have not seen it since it came out, so I don't remember almost anything about it. My mind just immediately jumped to it uh, because I had mentioned South Africa. But I do believe there's quite a bit of other um, discussions and criticisms and context surrounding District 9 that make it a an interesting example of contextual analysis of media. But when Anyways. you started talking about it, the example that popped into my head was H.P. Uh, Lovecraft. Yeah. Because his his stories are so like metaphorical right. and like the, they're all about the fear of the other. But if you don't know the context of, of who of, the other is, of who yeah. of who his H, other of was, who yeah. H.P. Lovecraft was and how like horribly, horribly racist he was. Yeah. Then that could just go over your right. head. That, that, yeah, that's a very good example. H.P. Love, Lovecraft is a very good example of that. Yeah. So I think it can go both ways. Like you can use that context to kind of hand wave and dismiss things if you're being disingenuous. But it could also be something where if you don't have that context, you won't even realize. Yeah. The reader might not even realize what they're reading is deeply problematic or whatever. But yeah, it's, it is. Yeah, it's a very interesting uh, discussion for sure. All right. Now that we have a little bit of a, a grounding contextually, let's discuss Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, the book. There is a mole right at the top of British intelligence. He's been there for years. For 25 years, we've been the only thing standing between Moscow and the Third World War. I'm retired. You're outside the family. You're well placed to look into this for us now. I'll do my utmost. I know that it is one of these men. All I want from you is one code name, Tinker. 
Taylor. Soldier. Spy. All right. So this is uh, 1974, as I mentioned, um, spy novel by British Irish author David Cornwell under the pseudonym John Le Carre. I saw your note did, earlier that said Cornwell, that and I was like, who is Cornwell? Yeah, I thought it was uh, <laughs> John Le Carre or whatever. Yeah. So the novel is considered a staple of the spy fiction genre. Uh, if you want to learn more about spy fiction, we did do a learning things segment on that in the prequel to our episode on the Bourne identity. There you go. So you can go back and listen to that if you want to learn more about spy fiction. The title of the novel alludes to a nursery rhyme and counting game, Tinker Tailor. Yeah. It's Tinker, Tailor, Soldier. It's not Spy. It's no, something it's not else. Spy. It's sailor. Something Tinker, else. Tailor, Soldier, Sailor, yeah. something. Poor man, rich man, thief, beggar, something. Something, something like, like that. that. Anyways. Uh, Tinker, Tailor, Soldier, Spy is the first in a uh, trilogy. It was followed by The Honorable Schoolboy in 1977 and Smiley's People in 1979. The three novels together make up the Carla trilogy, um, a who a Carla it's named for a recurring mostly unseen antagonist like in the Spectre. series. Yeah. Um, and I believe there are also like he wrote other novels with the main character of this book in them, but these like these are considered like this trilogy. Right. A uh, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy employs spy jargon that is represented as the authentic insider speak of British intelligence. Uh, Le Carre has noted that with the exception of a few terms like mole and legend, uh, this jargon was his own invention. So a lot of it was just stuff he fabricated. So it's apparently. not, in fact, a bunch no. of insider speak necessarily. Ne not necessarily. It's presented as such, but, but most of it was stuff he made up. Right. Uh, but in some cases, terms used in the novel have subsequently entered general usage. So that's kind of cool for him. Yeah. And and you did say that he had a history a background in yes he did the intelligence yeah. okay I was just making sure so he would at least know yeah. some of the yeah he would he stuff. would know some of it uh, a couple reviews uh, in a review for the New York Times um, critic Richard Locke called Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy fluently written noting that it quote is full of vivid character sketches of secret agents and bureaucrats from all levels of British society and the dialogue catches their voices well. The review also called protagonist George Smiley the anti-James Bond. There you go. An article published in in-house Central Intelligence Agency journal <laughs> um, presumably so the CIA's Pre journal. Yeah, uh, yeah, presumably written by agents under pseudonyms, um, called it, quote, one of the most enduring renderings of the profession. Well, there you go. Uh, John Powers. Well, if the CIA said uh, it, you know it's not true. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, John Powers of NPR has called the novel the greatest spy story ever told, noting that it, quote, offers the seductive fantasy of entering a secret world, one imagined with alluring richness. Wow. Um, and aside from the film that we'll be discussing, this novel has also been adapted for television by the BBC in 1979, as well as for radio in 1988 and again in 2009. Yeah. Uh, and I, I didn't realize at the time that this had been adapted uh, for TV mm -hmm. back in the day. And I was like, because I was looking and I was like, I saw it was recommended. It was like, oh, there's a mini series called Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. And I was like, oh. And, and then that one, the it's the 1980 or 79 BBC miniseries. Um, I believe it's like five or six episodes. Uh, Alec Guinness, Sir Alec Guinness plays uh, George Smiley. Hmm. Um, obviously, Alec Guinness, for those of you who are unaware <laughs> The original uh, Obi Wan Kenobi. So, uh, yeah, he plays the uh, Gary Oldman character in that version. Speaking of film adaptations of Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, we're going to talk about the 2011 film. I need you to do something. I'm going to have to send you up into the lion's den if you're caught. What the hell are you doing up here? You can't mention me. I know who you are. I have something to trade. Something big. She told me a secret. The mother of all secrets. She had information concerning a double agent. You have to assume they're watching you. Yeah. 
So as I mentioned, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy is a 2011 film directed by Thomas Alfredson, uh, Let the Right One In, and The Snowman, uh, uh, two other main movies that he is known for. Oh, wait, one of those is, is that uh, what version of yes, Let the Right the One In? Yes, that's the original one. The like the, Swedish, the Swedish one. one yes. Okay. Um, the the American remake of it is called Let Me In, not Let oh. the Right One In. I don't think I knew that. I've never seen the American and, one. And the American one is also directed by, I believe, Matt Reeves, the guy who did the Batman. Oh, okay. Anyways. Um, <laughs> and and uh, a bunch of the, uh, the, the all the remakes of the, uh, not remakes, the new um, Planet of the Apes movies. Oh. I think yeah. that's Matt Reeves. I think he did all of those. Anyways. Uh, yes, but the original let the right one in from 19, or 2000, like 2000 something. Uh, and then The Snowman. One of those movies, very good. One of those movies, famously very bad. The Snowman... <laughs> is like has been talked about as being i have not seen it supposedly terrible also based on a book uh let the right one in i think it's based on a book or a story or something i can't remember um but a very good film uh this one was written by bridget o'connor known for 66 uh and a bunch of other like that was the main movie credit i think she had a bunch of like uh theater and stuff credits Mm. Uh, and then peter strawn who is known for how to lose friends and alienate people the men who stare at goats the snowmen and frank among other things This film stars Gary Oldman, Kathy Burke, Benedict Cumberbatch, Colin Firth, Stephen Graham, Tom Hardy, Kieran Hines, John Hurt, Toby Jones, Simon McBurney, and Mark Strong. So quite a cast. I know most of those people, honestly. Yeah. The film has an 84% on Rotten Tomatoes, an 85% on Metacritic, and a 7 out of 10 on IMDb. It made $81.2 million against a budget of $21 million and was nominated for three Oscars, including Best Actor for Gary Oldman, Best Writing for Bridget O'Connor and Peter Strawn, Strawn, and Best Original Score for Alberto Iglesias. Did not win any of them. Oh. That's why I said nominated. <laughs> oh, we didn't mention that at the end of the last episode, didn't we? To come back and hear about all the, all the awards yes. that the movie didn't win. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the project started when Peter Morgan, uh, the writer of Frost Nixon, wrote a draft of the screenplay and offered it to working title films to produce. Eventually, he would leave the project for personal reasons, but would stay on as an executive producer. Uh, when he left, they then brought on, uh, who did I say, O'Connor and Strawn to write mm-hmm. it. Uh, so another veteran director of ours, Park Chan-wook, uh, who directed The Handmaiden, was considered to direct the film, but turned it down eventually, uh, which led to Thomas Alfredson signing on for his first English language film. He is Swedish. Origin- or he's from Sweden, and all of his films had been uh, in Sweden and in Swedish until that point. So Gary Oldman was the first person cast in the film by director Alfredson, and mere- but mere days before filming, and again, take this for what it means, or for what it is. Uh, apparently, he was still the only lead actor who had officially been contracted. I still think other people were cast. They just maybe hadn't signed on the dotted line or uh, whatever. To me, that sounds like that's what that yeah. means. Yeah. Um, uh, but other actors, some other interesting actors that were considered for roles in the film included uh, David Thu- Thewlis, uh, Michael Fassbender, who was ultimately, uh, his role was uh, filled by Tom Hardy, and Jared Harris, who was ultimately, fil- uh, his role was played by Toby Jones. So a couple other big names who were almost in the film, but for other random reasons, didn't didn't end up filming. Uh, so uh, the the author, John Le, Car- uh, Le Carre, you said? Yeah. Uh, he actually has a cameo in the film as a guest in a party scene. Hmm. I, that was all the details I could find. I, I could probably go on YouTube and like find the actual clip. I'm sure somebody's yeah. posted it. But apparently in one of the party scenes, he's there. Or in a party scene, Something he's there. Something to keep an eye out guest. for. If you Google John Le, uh, Le Carre and find a picture of him and then look out for him. All right. And then a handful of uh, INDB trivia facts here. Uh, Gary Oldman apparently went to a place called Old Focals, which is an eyeglass store in Pasadena, California, to find the right glasses for George Smiley. Uh, he said, quote, glasses are funny things. For Smiley, they're iconic. It's like James Bond's Aston Martin or the vodka martini. Uh, he apparently tried on hundreds of glasses before he found ones that he thought were appropriate for his character. So. Mm. Obviously, Gary Oldman had a very long career, uh, uh, has had a very long career, um, but he uh, this this film in 2012 was his first Oscar nomination, uh, like for anything Hmm. or for acting, it says. I I guess the idea is that maybe films he had been in, like one best picture or nominated, but this was his first acting nomination for uh, an Academy Award. 
uh, he would eventually go on to win, I think, a couple. He definitely won, I believe, for that one where he plays Winston Churchill. I don't remember what that's called, but anyways, he did not win for this one. Uh, so director Thomas Alfredson uh, had author John Le Care write part of the dialogue for the circus conference. He said, quote, when we rehearsed it, it felt as if Bill Hayden, Colin Firth's character, should say something. But what would he say? Well, why not call John Le Carey and see if he's in? And we called him and we described the situation. He thought for 15 seconds and then he said, grab a pen. Here it is. It was a fantastic moment. So they just apparently would call up the author of the book and be like, hey, we need some dialogue <laughs> for this character. And he would do it, or at least in that one instance. Uh, apparently, in an interview at some point, Gary Oldman said that uh, for this film, he had to relearn his native English accent because he had been he had lost most of it since moving to the U.S. and playing so many like American speaking roles. Interesting. Which I I don't know if I believe that. But I don't we'll see. I don't know. I don't understand accents fully. I don't think. No, because I don't have one. <laughs> yes, we have the boring nothing <laughs> accent of being from the Midwest, like yeah. affluent Midwest. It's like, but nothing. not like an interesting part of the Midwest. Yeah. like we don't have like North Midwest no. accents. We're no. just affluent middle Midwest, boring nothing accents. Yeah, like we're just f- kind of out here being radio hosts. Yep. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah, it's interesting, but uh. Supposedly, yeah, he had to relearn his English accent, or at least a little bit. And then finally, a few reviews of the film. Jonathan Romney of The Independent wrote, quote, The script is a brilliant feat of condensation and restructuring. Writers Peter Strawn and the late Bridget O'Connor realized the novel realized the novel is overtly about information and its flow and reshape its daunting complexity to highlight that. So it sounds like there are definitely some changes, but mm. um, it, the kind of things that make sense, condensation and restructuring, that's usually... Yeah. Hopefully they didn't just completely write a different story like they did with Annihilation. Uh, Peter Travers of Rolling Stone wrote, quote, As Alfredson directs this, the expert script by Peter Strawn and Bridget O'Connor, the film emerges as a tale of loneliness and desperation among men who can never disclose their secret hearts even to themselves. It's easily one of the year's best films. Writing in the Atlantic, Le Carre admirer James Parker favor- favorably contrasted Smiley with the James Bond franchise but found that this adaptation was problematic compared to the 1979 BBC miniseries writing, quote, to strip down or minimalize Le Carre, however, is to sacrifice the most Tolkien-esque grain and depth of his created world. The decades-long backstory, the lingo, the arcana, the liturgical repetitions of names and functions. So he felt that they, the film, this film lost some of the mm. quintessential Le Carre-ness so he felt that the movie did it better, or the book did it the better. The book did it better, did it and better. that this okay. film was not quite, and, and it sounds like he thought that the 1979 BBC miniseries did it better, and that it, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't quite capture the depth of mm. what he got from the book. Interesting. We'll see if you have any similar opinion or not, <laughs> as not a giant fan of John Le Carre. Well, I don't have a problem. That's what I, that's what him, I mean. But... Like, I didn't mean that negatively. I just meant like as someone who is not, yeah, who doesn't have a, a side in that, in that fight. No, no horse in this race. No, no horse in that race. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I wanted to remind you before we wrap up that you can do us a giant favor by heading over to patreoncom slash this film is lit. Support us there for a few bucks a month. Get access to different stuff, including bonus content. And at the fifteen dollar and up level, you get access to priority recommendations, which means you can send us a message requesting for us to talk about a movie or book that you would really love for us to talk about. And we will get it on the schedule as soon as we can. This one coming up, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, is one of those patron requests. Katie, who is it from? This was a request from Jeff Niederhofer. Jeff Niederhofer. All right. Thank you for requesting Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. Katie, where can the people watch it? Well, as always, you can check with your local library or a local video rental store if you happen to still have one of those. If not, you can stream this with a subscription through Max Go, whatever not HBO that is. HBO Max? I think it's a totally different thing. I had to look this one up because I had never heard of it. I've never heard of Max Go. Yeah, but I think it's a totally different thing is than it HBO. Is Cinemax Go, maybe? I think so. Okay. Yeah, but they call it Max Go. Interesting. Well, because, yeah, when I click, when I searched Max Go, what came up was Cinemax Go, and it's it says Cinemax Go, but... Oh, when I saw it, it was just Max Go, so maybe they call it both, or maybe, yeah, maybe one it, of those is outdated. Who says, knows? 
Uh, is Max Go still available? It's gone. As of May 1st, 2020, the Max Go is no longer in, is no longer on iOS and Android devices. There's no indication as to why Cinemax decided to eliminate the app, but parent. So maybe it used to be called Max Go and Cinemax rebranded it just to Cinemax Go. Okay. Because it's funny uh, on the so it says Cinemax Go, but the um, URL is MaxGo.com. Yeah. So I'm thinking at one point it was Max Go, and then they were like, "Nobody, we're Cinemax. Right. People know the term Cinemax. Cinemax. Why did we drop the Cine? <laughs> like, let's just call it Cinemax Go." <laughs> All right. So, well, you anyways, can, apparently you can stream it if you have a subscription to Cinemax Go. Yeah. Um, or you can rent it for around four to five dollars. From Apple TV, Amazon, YouTube, Vudu, Redbox, DirecTV, or Spectrum TV. So any of your rental places. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. I'm looking forward to this. I heard this movie was good back when it came out. I never saw it. Um, it definitely looks like it could be dry, but it also think it, I'm more I, having now. Uh, I was a little less excited for it than I was or than I am now, having read some of the stuff about it and a. Uh, some of the comparisons to like it being like this like very foundational like spy thriller mm -hmm. i'm excited i do like a good spy story every now and then and i think this one could be good and i always like gary oldman so got a hell of a cast Can't i have no horse that. in this race i i also like thomas <laughs> alfredson a lot uh let the right one in i think is uh -huh. a fantastic film um so i'm interested to see what he does with this one because yeah i think he i think he's a very good talented director so Anyways, we shall see in one week's time what we think of Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. Until that time, guys, gals, non binary pals, and everybody else, keep reading books, watching movies, and, and keep, keep being, being awesome. awesome.